Hi, welcome to my podcast, Reclaim. I am your host, Thais Skye. I have supported women navigate the complexities of being human for over 10 years. This podcast is where I disseminate some of those learnings and offer thoughts and guests to guide you into your healing. Welcome. Hello, 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 my friends. Thais Sky here. Welcome to Reclaim. We are deep in this new series that I have created called Talk Therapy, How to Get the Help You Need. It's been so wonderful to be in this series with you all. I hope that you are, are enjoying it as much as I am enjoying offering my thoughts about how the world of psychotherapy works and how maybe armed with this knowledge, you may be able to be um, uh, more equipped to get the help you need. Now, in this episode, we're going to be talking all about the actual process of going to therapy. I want to talk about how to find a therapist, what to expect in your first session, how to make sure it's the right fit, uh, termination, what happens if you can't find the right fit. We're going to talk about all of it. This is probably like the most important episode of the series, but all of the other episodes kind of feed into it. So if you haven't had a chance to listen to the other episodes and you're just tuning in for this one, that's totally fine. Um, but it may be helpful for you to check out part one, two, and three, um, because each part kind of fits together to paint this greater picture that I'm painting for all of us, um, that talk therapy is a really effective, powerful modality for how to guide us deeper into ourselves. There's a lot of really exciting stuff right now. There's somatic psychotherapy that's really trendy right now. EMDR is really trendy right now. There's so many different things that are really, really um exciting in the field and nothing takes away from the efficacy of psychotherapy, of long-term emotional support. And so if you are interested in engaging in that type of long-term emotional support, uh, emotionally intimate support, let's start diving into, okay, I get it, Thais. Therapy works. How do I get myself into therapy. Because I'm imagining if you're listening to this, you're interested in therapy and interested in the world of therapy. The best question to ask yourself of like, should I go into therapy? Is simply, am I curious about going into therapy? Do I have maybe a suspicion that therapy may help me? If you answer yes to these questions, then yes, go try it out. Um, therapy can be absolutely for everyone. It doesn't have to just be for people who who uh, oh, struggle with quote unquote mental illness. It's not just about mental disorders. It's not just about um, having a disorder and then fixing it. Therapy offers us a portal into ourselves. It offers us a way for us to learn more about ourselves. It offers us tools and skills and understanding of how we see the world. It's a way that we can make sense of things with another human. It's not just for people who are struggling with what the DSM considers a mental disorder. Yes, although obviously if you struggle with a mental illness, therapy may be really helpful for you. Okay, so if therapy is for everybody, everybody can, if they want to benefit from it, everybody can benefit from it. It may not work um, for everyone in, in, in the sense that like not everyone is interested. And if you're not interested, you're probably not going to benefit from it. But if you are interested, if it's piquing your curiosity, go try it out. Now, the number one factor that will allow for psychotherapy to work. The, the, the most important thing that allows psychotherapy to work is what's called the working alliance or the therapeutic relationship. It's the relationship between client, patient, and therapist. That relationship is what allows the therapy 
to be successful. So on the one hand, you have you and what you bring into therapy and your belief that therapy is going to work or your desire, your hopes, your dreams. There's the you part of the equation. And then there's the therapist part of the equation, the experience, their ability to hold faith that therapy will work for you, their professionalism, um, their training. That's what the therapist brings. And then together, when you bring both individuals together, you create a working alliance. It means that you have to work. It means the therapist has to work. And then together, you create something really dynamic. In the world of the medical um, profession, which is where often mental health is kind of swoop, swooped, <laughs> swooped, um, placed under, which I've made many arguments for why mental health should not be put in the medical model view of things. But just ride this wave with me for a minute. You know, we look at going to the doctor as almost a passive experience, right? There's something wrong with you. You go to the doctor. The doctor looks at you, determines what's wrong with you. They do the assessment. They do the evaluation. They know what to look for. They see that there's something wrong with you. And then they tell you what to do to fix it. And maybe some of what you do is on you, but mostly it's on them. You go to this doctor, they'll give you this treatment, you get this medicine, you do this thing, and then your your physical health will be recovered. Well, so it makes sense that if mental health is often placed under the medical model, that we think of therapies the same way. We go to a professional, they tell us what's wrong with us. We may do some things to fix it, but mostly it's their expertise that's going to um, guide us into our healing. But psychotherapy doesn't work that way. We can't be expectant. We have to work. We have to bring in our work to make this work. Um, it's not um, going to support you if you go into it expecting the other person to do the work for you. That's not how psychotherapy works, yes? So in the working alliance, what makes therapy works? There's the you part and there's the therapist part. Now, let's break it down to the therapist part and then we're going to talk about the you part, yes? Let's talk about even the most fundamental basics, how to find a therapist. Now, you can Google this. There's tons of resources out there for how to find the therapist. I personally think a great place to start is to think about your needs and preferences. What are you seeking therapy for? Is it for just general overall improvement and deepening insight? Um, are you going because you're experiencing some type of challenge that's very specific, let's say relational issues with your mother or, um, to, you know, you would categorize what you're experiencing under a disorder? Um, knowing what it is that you're kind of wanting and needing from therapy is a great place to start because that will then guide you into determining what your preferences are. Um, for example, um, does the age of your therapist matter? Does the gender of your therapist matter? Does um, your therapist's modality, how they work, does that matter to you? For many of us, the answer is not really. And for some of us, the answer is absolutely. If we carry a marginalized identity, it may be really nice to have a therapist with that marginalized identity. Though that does not necessarily mean that they will understand you. Every experience is unique. Maybe there's something really healing about seeing someone who have experienced a similar struggle to you um, to be able to guide you. Some of us look for a different experience. Um, for example, I may want to work with a female therapist to help me navigate what it means for me to be a woman. And if I'm having particular ch issues or challenges with with um, uh, things that pertain to being a woman, it may be really helpful for me to work with a woman therapist, for example. But let's say that maybe I want to work with a male therapist. I want to work with a man who can help heal the parts of me that I resent about my father. Or I resent about patriarchy. That could be a route I take too. So maybe for me right now, gender doesn't really matter. Or maybe it does, right? Really depending on what I'm thinking about right now may be useful for me in my healing. Um, this, you know, is where um, if you have, uh, let's say, a particular trauma, you may want to be sensitive to that. If you have a trauma around um, a particular type of person, you may want to be sensitive about a therapist that doesn't spark that, or maybe that does spark that so you can address it and heal it. There really is no no right or wrong. I know plenty of people who have had multiple therapists, and each therapist have played a role in their healing. Um 
but it may be helpful to think about it because maybe it is really important for you that the therapist be young, for example, around your age, or maybe they're older than you, et cetera, et cetera. That's going to obviously help you determine how to find a fit. Okay. Now, there are many places that you can go for therapy. You can go to clinics. Um, here in Los Angeles, there are various mental health community clinics that are sliding scale um, that can go from as low as 15. I know some clinics go as low as zero to $5 a session. Um, and then clinics that can go all the way up to like $100 or $105 a session. Uh, clinics are a great place to go. Um, if, you know, uh, affordability is important for you. But do know that most clinics um, are students and they will leave the clinic um, roughly every year to two years. And so that's a part of the experience is um, managing the loss of a therapist and a new therapist, new relationship, etc. Some clinics allow you to go with the therapist to private practice, but then usually when a therapist goes into private practice, they do raise their fee. Not always, but sometimes. Um, so there's clinics. You, you could also, if you're in school, if you're in university, um, sometimes schools have counseling options. They um, offer students a limited number of sessions for therapists. That may be a good place to start. Some workplaces have um, accessibility to therapists or they'll pay for part of it. So you can look into that. Um, of course, you can always go the insurance route and ask your insurance if they cover it. Um, typically, if you have a HMO policy, your therapist is going to have to be in network, which means that you're going to have to ask them for a list of therapists. Not all insurance covers this, so you'll have to look to make sure that yours covers. Um, but that means that the therapist has had to choose to be on the panel of that insurance in order for them to be considered in network. And then, of course, if you have, um, you can choose maybe an out-of-network option if you have, let's say, a PPO um, that allows you to have out-of-network, and, and you may submit to them a super bill every month, um, and they'll cover a d your deductible or a, a part of your fee, okay? And then in order to use insurance, you're most likely probably looking at therapists at a private practice. Now, of course, all of this is under the, the term, the umbrella of individual one-on-one -on -one therapy. This is different than if you were to do a treatment center, for example, or inpatient, outpatient center, um, which I covered in uh, episode one. Most of the times we look for therapists in private practice. Um, and you can go to something like psychology today and search for therapists, um, in your area using your zip code. I would say like a factor that may be something for you to consider is, um, how easy it is to get to their office. Um, if you live in a town like Los Angeles where um, it, it gets very spread apart, I wouldn't want to look for a therapist that is too, too far away because it may be very difficult to get there on time based on my schedule. Um, okay, so then you look, it's, uh, you know, a little awkward to look at psychology today. You look at their pictures, you look at their blurb, and, and you kind of have to just gamble and give them a call. Um, most therapists offer a phone consultation, um, which can be anywhere between I don't know, 15 minutes, 30 minutes. It really depends on the therapist, but they'll usually do a little bit of a consultation on the phone. And some therapists do like a free first session. Um, most therapists, once you go into a session, you are paying for that session. Um, and so, okay. So then most offers like a free phone consultation where you can get a general vibe. Um, and of course, the most important questions to ask on a phone consultation is one, if you're planning on using insurance, if they take insurance, um, two, their fee, of course, and uh, many private practice um, uh, therapists will offer a fee. And if that fee feels really inaccessible, you can always ask if they do offer any sliding scales. Many private practice clinicians that I know have a small number of, se of sessions that they do offer on a sliding scale fee. And then, of course, availability has to match up. Um, you may also maybe ask some general questions or the, the therapist will ask you some general questions. Why are you seeking therapy um, to get a vibe, to get a sense of can they help you? And if it all feels good, if like, okay, I'm, yeah, this feels fine. This feels comfortable. Odds are the next step is to have your first session with that therapist. 
Um, oh, and another question you can ask, of course, you can ask whatever questions you want, but another question that may be helpful for you to ask in that initial consultation call is what modality they use. What, what, how do they see you? Um, usually this is listed on their website. It's also listed on their psychology today profile. Google is your best friend. But if you're really, if you listen to the series and you're really committed to a modality, it feels really important for you to work in a certain way, then of course you want to make sure that that therapist works in that way. And then it's time for your first session. Oh my gosh, how exciting is your first session? I imagine that you're very nervous. You're meeting this person for the first time. Usually at something like a clinic, you will be um, assigned a person. Usually at a clinic, you'll do an intake with someone who may or may not be the therapist that gets set up with you. Um, so you'll go to the clinic, you'll fill out some forms, you'll do an initial intake, and then they will assign you a therapist that they feel like is a good fit. Um, and then it's time to go in. Usually, um, you'll have a list of paperwork that you may have to sign. It includes your informed consent. It, sometimes it inf includes like a medical history. Um, some people do very long forms. Some do very short forms. There isn't um, um, too much clarity in terms of law and ethics about uh, how long forms have to be, but they do have to generally cover a few things like confidentiality. Okay. I'm looking at this website um, and it has like questions to ask before you make your first appointment. You don't necessarily have to ask these questions, but you may want to. So just some ideas um, like what professional associations do you belong to? I've never been asked that question. I don't even know how I would answer that question. I don't know what that question means, but maybe you want to ask that to your therapist. Um, what is your academic background? What is your training? If you are coming in with a very specific thing, let's say trauma or grief, you know, you may want to ask if your therapist has competence in those areas. If they don't, you you can always ask during that initial consult to give you a, f a few number, a few names and numbers of people who they know who may be able to really be in that expertise. Um and then this website says cost, experience, what specialized training and experience you have. Um, rules, what are your office protocols? This is a great question to ask in your first session. It's also probably going to be in your informed consent, what their cancellation policy is. And then the other question here that you could ask um, is specialties. What kind of therapy do you do? Some therapists do a whole variety of different things. Um, EMDR, somatic therapy, um, internal family systems, whatever it is. And maybe you, that's helpful for you to know what they do. Um, okay. So, you went in, you signed your forms, it's time for your first session. Sometimes a therapist won't give you those forms in the first session because they're still trying to get to know you and to make sure that they want to work with you. And it'd be silly for you to fill out a whole bunch of forms only for them to be like, you know what, I actually think that what you need is this and give you that referral. So some, if you go in for a first session and you don't get forms, that's totally normal. They will then probably most likely give you forms to sign before your next session. Okay, um, so your first session. Now, there's a initial period. I like to think about it around like five sessions where I'm very much in the getting to know the client. Now, I am pretty much getting to know my clients for, for the duration of our work together because people are fascinating and there's always more to know. But I just mean that the first like five to 10 sessions, I'm really assessing to see if this feels like the right fit for me. And so maybe it's a good idea for you to also be thinking in the first few sessions, if this feels like the right fit for you. Does it feel like the therapist gets it? Do you feel comfortable? Like how is it in the session with that therapist? Usually the, a therapist in the first session will either open it up completely and ask you to just start wherever and um, they'll ask questions and clarify and you're kind of starting the treatment that way. Or sometimes they're a little bit more structure, structure, structured and they'll ask you like, what are you experiencing? What brought you to therapy? What do you feel is going on? What's a little bit of your history, your childhood, living situation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then you'll go from there. Yes. One question that I think is a non-negotiable. If there's only one question that I personally would definitively ask a new therapist for sure, more than anything else is how many hours of 
personal psychotherapy have you completed? Are you in your own therapy now? I am, it's very interesting to me how people answer this question. I have a supervisor, for example, right now, who's like, I'm not in personal therapy right now, but I've been in analysis for 12 years and have done therapy in and out um, throughout my life. That feels like a satisfactory answer to me in terms of if I wanted to work with a therapist. I think a therapist who takes their own mental health really, really importantly is someone that I can trust with my own mental health. I'm always weary of um, therapists who feel like they're above it or don't need it because it means that they don't really understand how this works. And I'm not interested in that. Okay. So if somebody were to ask me that, I would be transparent, but I would also be interested in why they're asking. So I tend to not just answer the question that I'm receiving, but also wanting to know what the question is about. Because oftentimes that's important too. Maybe the underneath the question is, can you help me? And I think maybe it's more useful for the therapist to answer that question than to answer the, the initial question. Okay. So a couple things to kind of be mindful of in terms of expectations of your therapy. One, it's not a quick fix. That's obvious. We're talking about long-term support. We're talking about, um, you know, th- no problem has an obvious answer because that's kind of infantilizing, right? If you had an obvious answer, you'd probably do it. It's just not that simple, you know. This is, again, the difference between going to a medical doctor and going to a psychotherapist. You know, the medical doctor is going to give you the answers, is going to give you the fixes, or at least try. They may not know either, but they may have ideas, and you just now have to just do those things. But in psychotherapy, is different. There are no quick fix, and the psychotherapist is not the the expert in the room. I, you know, can observe and notice that my client is really resentful at her dad for whatever reason. And I could say that to her, but if I don't say it in a way that she may be able to hear it, then she's going to dismiss it and it's not going to do anything. It's not going to be useful. So my quote unquote expertise, my ability to see and to hear what's going on, I'm also being trained to understand when to to offer that idea. It's much more powerful when it comes from us than when it comes from somebody else. It's just not like going to a doctor's office and I really hate the metaphor. It's a totally different experience. Okay. Okay. Also, it's not just talking about your problems. Therapy is not just going in and venting. That's not what's happening here. We're talking about problems, sure, but there's another layer of what's happening. We're talking about our problems, but we're making sense of it with someone else. We're trying to understand what's going on within us from while also being witnessed and being seen and being understood by another who is helping us see our problems, see our perspective of our problems, see what's going on between us and our problems and helping us develop a different understanding of what's going on within ourselves and in our problems. So a therapist is not just going to like listen to you ramble for 50 minutes and then collect your money. It just it, A therapist is trained to be able to listen and understand and go underneath the surface to try to get to a place where you're understanding your problems in a different way. Yes. Now you're not paying your therapist to be your friend and it's actually unethical and illegal for your, your therapist to befriend you. Um, there's something called dual relationshiping or dual relationships where it's ethically very hazy about whether or not you can allow yourself to have a dual relationship with your, with your client. It's not that dual relationships are bad or wrong or can't happen. It's just that we try to limit them because there's a power in different, uh, uh, power difference and there's complications and you're holding people's stories and their traumas and their vulnerability. It's awkward for us to then enter a different relationship like a friendship. Um, and so in places like small rural areas, you may, your therapist may also be your daughter's basketball coach, for example. And then we have to think about that. We have to talk about that together and make sure that we understand the consequences of that and the ramifications of that. There's only so much that we can do, but we really try to manage as the clinicians how many dual relationships we have when we enter. Obviously, a very... Um, um, it, it, tempting desire is to be friends with our therapist, especially if you feel like our therapist really understands us. But it's not in your best interest to be friends with your therapist. Um, your therapist is a professional and they're there to guide you into deepening and understanding yourself. We're not meant to be friends and that's a good thing. 
Okay. Um, and like I said before, therapists don't have the answers. They don't have the answers to your problems. I wish I had answers to people's problems because I feel like it would make me feel really good about myself. But it's not ultimately in the service of my patients for me to just give them the answers to their problems. It doesn't really ever work that way. And I don't, I, I see my patients with sovereignty and capacity to be able to fix their own problems, but maybe together we can think about those problems and understand them and maybe we can come up with answers together. Um, so that going in with expectations that are manageable is important. If you're going into a therapist's office expecting them to have answers and then they don't have answers, well, you're, it's not going to feel very good, right? And you're maybe going to think that therapy isn't working. Okay. So that's the first session. Those are the expectations. Let me see what else I have here. Oh, let's talk about some um, red flags and green flags that you can see in your therapist to make sure that the relationship is the way that may be most useful for you. Here are some red flags that I have seen or I've heard of that I would be weary if this was my therapist. One, frequent cancellations and frequent last minute cancellations. Obviously, if it's coming out of the blue and it's short term, there may just be something going on here. But if it's chronic, if it's consistent throughout the treatment, that your therapist is not respecting your time, constantly rescheduling, etc., mm, that may not be useful. That may not be good. Um, the other one is um, flirting or any type of sexual anything. Um, you're not. It is illegal for a therapist to have sex or any type of sexual contact with their patients. Um, it is so illegal that um, there's really strong ramifications for that. Um, and it's sad how often this happens, but it's not supposed to happen. And we've been drilled in from day one. Do not have sexual contact with your patients. You do not have sex with your patients. And yet the, st the statistics are quite alarming and quite sad. Flirting um, or any type of sexual um, relationship is inappropriate. Now, I will say that sometimes if we have um, a therapist who we are attracted to or we have sexual feelings towards, this is actually quite normal. Um, you know, there is nothing wrong with having feelings towards your therapist. And the invitation is to talk about it with your therapist. I know that may sound terrifying, but this is actually quite normal. And therapists are trained to deal with this and to talk about it. And ideally, your therapist will be able to explore this with you and to understand this with you of what's happening here. What's the attraction? What's the desire? Et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Another really important point, a red flag, is if the therapist violates confidentiality. Now, confidentiality is really, really, really important. Therapists are bound by confidentiality, which means that anything you share with your therapist needs to be kept between you and your therapist. That means to the extent that if you comment on your therapist's Yelp review, if you comment on your therapist's DM, they are not supposed to respond because the very act of responding is affirming that you are their patient. Um, so it goes to the point where if you see your therapist in public, your therapist is not going to be, should not be the one to acknowledge you first. They're going to act like they don't know you until you give them permission and you say, hey, I know you. And then the therapist will respond. Um, confidentiality is, the, is, is key. It's absolutely key. If you have addiction, if you've struggled with self-harm, if you struggle with, um, um, you know, thinking about suicide ideation, all of this needs to be talked about and invited to talk about, invited to be talked about with your therapist. Now, of course, there are limits to confidentiality. The most common limits are harm to self, harm to others, which means if you are actively attempting to kill yourself, your therapist is a mandated reporter and is required to interfere. If you are considering killing someone else, your therapist is a mandated recorder, reporter and required to interfere. 
So if you have suicide ideation, talk about it. But if it gets very serious and you're thinking about killing yourself, your therapist is going to do what he need, he or she or they need to do to support you. Um, the other limits are distribution of child pornography, elder abuse, dependent adult abuse, um, ch- and of course, child abuse. Um, if you report that you hit your child or that you, you know, sexually assaulted a minor um, who is still a minor or you're in contact with, your therapist is a mandated reporter and will have to report that. Most of the times, the therapist will talk to you about it. Um, hopefully, it doesn't sever the treatment. Um, but we want to protect those who cannot protect themselves, and that includes children. So besides those kind of exceptions to confidentiality, you can tell your therapist literally anything. And I've heard it all. You know, I hear so much. I'm literally trained to hear it and to be okay with it and to process it with you. Nothing you share with me is out of bounds. I want to hear everything, including your feelings towards me, so we can talk about it and understand it and figure it out. Um, okay. Okay. If your therapist is chronically forgetting important details, like keeps forgetting over and over and over again, the the name of your partner, for example, that would be a red flag. Maybe not, um, I wouldn't maybe um, end treatment, for example, but maybe if it continued to feel like my therapist wasn't really listening to me, that would be really frustrating. So those are just some red flags. Um, and then we have some green flags. Like, how do you feel safe and supported in therapy? What What is happening in the in the room, right? There's safety. There's empathy. There's curiosity. There's authenticity. There's connection. There's professionalism. All these things, when they're present, can make the, the patient feel really welcomed and, and really warm and um, into doing the, the hard work that is therapy. Okay, so you had a really good first session. It's like, okay, I think this is a good fit. Now, there's this idea like a good enough fit. It, it's my um, version of the good enough mother, which is a concept developed by D.W. Winnicott um, in attempts to um, understand how good of a mother do you have to be in order to um, create the most um, emotionally um, mature child, Right. And you don't actually have to be the perfect mother. And in fact, being the perfect mother is contraindicated. Um, it doesn't create emotionally bright children. Um, the type, the part, the the mother that we strive to be or, or caregiver, parent, whatever, father, whatever role you are, what you strive to do is to be good enough. Good enough is actually perfect. Good enough is what will create the right environment for children to thrive. And so just like the good enough mother, I think of therapy, the therapeutic relationship as simply needing to be good enough. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be mind blowing. Aha, perfect, perfect fit. I don't even know what perfect fit looks like. It just has to feel good enough. It has to feel supportive and, 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 um, nurturing and safe. Um, but it, 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 what I'm trying to say is that you don't have to have so much pressure to find this therapist that is going to blow your mind. Yes, the therapist just has to be good enough for it to create the treatment outcomes that you desire, for you to feel better, for you to um, deepen your relationship with yourself. Okay, so you had your first session. It was good enough. It was okay. This may be a good fit. Now what? Well, now you enter treatment that you enter the process of psychotherapy. You know, psychotherapy is not a transaction. And this is important for us to keep in mind. Yes, there is the energy exchange of money um, if you are paying out of pocket. But when we look at psychotherapy as a transaction, then we are paying for someone to deliver something to us. Again, it's that passive experience. I invite us to look at psychotherapy as a relationship that we are entering in where there is an energetic exchange in exchange for this person to listen and to help us make sense of things. We are exchanging it for money. If we look at relation at, at this as therapy as a relationship, well, then it makes sense that this idea of we heal in relationships would definitively apply to psychotherapy. The agent, the the mechanism that makes psychotherapy work is the relationship, is the working alliance. So rather than thinking about it, when we think about it as a transaction, as this we're using this person for our gain, 
we're probably not going to develop the type of um, connection required in order for change, emotional change to happen. So the this is where the modalities really come into play. What your therapist is listening for is really going to be based on their theory, on their orientation. If your therapist is more CBT, they're going to be listening for maladaptive thoughts. They're going to be listening for intrusive thoughts. They're going to be listening for belief systems that need to be changed, and they're going to work with you to change those beliefs. If you work, let's say, with an internal family systems therapist who only does that, they're listening for parts. They're listening to understand um, how the different parts within you are playing out and give and, and bring your awareness to those parts. If you're working um, with a therapist who is based on systems theory, they're going to be looking and listening for how you have learned um, to be who you are out of a system around you. So the modality your therapist works under is going to inform what they listen to and what they bring their attention to. Many therapists take on more than one modality, and maybe they're more of an eclectic mix, and maybe you'll hear that and see that in your work. If you're listening to how I talk and it's interesting to you, then you may benefit from a psychodynamic approach. What I listen to in my work um, is the is for the relationship. I'm a relational therapist. I like to think about relation for uh, psychotherapy as a relationship. And just like how our shit gets played out in all of our relationships, right, from childhood, it all just gets stirred up and acted out and played out with all the people in our lives, it is inevitably going to come up in the therapy. And when it does, that's a wonderful place for us to explore and unpack in real time. So I see everything as relationship and I'm listening for that. I'm also listening for what may be going on underneath the surface that may be out of your awareness. I'm thinking about and bringing your attention to the complexity of the conflicts within you. I'm paying attention to and listening to the depth of your feelings and how your feelings came to be and help you understand the core of them and um, give you a greater sense of what may be here that is not in your conscious mind. So that's how I work as a relational psychoanalytic psychotherapist. Um, other people do it differently. Uh, and it really ultimately always just is determined by um, um, the whether or not treatment will work is again, is the working alliance that what you bring and what the therapist brings. Now, we've talked a lot about what the therapist needs to bring, the professionalism, the care. They're bringing in all this, their training, their expertise. Let's talk about what you need to bring into the therapy in order for the therapy to work. Um, you know, it's very um, important to reflect on how your issues, your challenges may be a part of the treatment. Because therapy is often painful, and this is not necessarily reflective of a therapist being incompetent or the treatment not working, but rather it it reflects on the fact that treatment is often about addressing painful thoughts and feelings. So for the, you know, there may be times where you leave therapy feeling worse than before, not because the therapy isn't working or not because the therapist is incompetent, but because this is what it looks like in the healing journey. Healing isn't linear. It's not going to go from, I feel shitty, I go to therapy, I feel better. Therapists often encourage us to do deeper work, to look at stuff more closely. And that means things may feel worse sometimes. And that's just a part of the treatment. Yes? And hopefully, you know, a good therapist will help you make sense of all of it. But you're still ultimately going to have to feel the stuff. And that may not always feel good. You know, therapy is often about learning how to address issues from our past that's playing out in the present. And that means having to give up a lot of the ways we've learned how to navigate life. And that means that there's going to be an in-between where we're giving up the old things, but we haven't really grasped the new way yet, where we're vulnerable and we're, we're much more in contact with the painful parts of ourselves that have had to use strategies that no longer feel effective. 
And yeah, it just kind of sucks sometimes. It just doesn't always feel good. Now, if you're consistently not feeling good and it doesn't make sense to you, talk about it with your therapist. I always invite my clients to talk about anything. Bring it all in. Everything is welcome here. I want to, if we can talk, if you can bring it in, we can talk about it and we can figure it out. If you don't bring it in, we can't talk about it. We can't figure it out. And you're left to carrying this really heavy stuff on your own. And that's really how you make the most of therapy is by showing up, by bringing your full self in. Um, and that can be hard. And that's exactly the point. Sometimes it is hard. And, you know, Notice the patterns. If you cycle through therapists very quickly, there's probably something here that needs tending to. If you um, are consistently, chronically feeling like no one understands you, there's probably something more than just incompetent therapists. But also the right fit is important. And don't hesitate to look for another therapist if it's just not feeling right. And, you know, you can talk about it with your therapist. You can say, hey, something's not feeling right. You can try to make sense of it. But if it's continually feeling like "Mm, not quite it, you know, we encourage you, therapists encourage you to keep looking. And this can be really frustrating. And it can really prevent people from from seeking cares because the first fit wasn't a good fit. So therapy must just be completely shitty. But it's it's like saying like you're going on your first date and it didn't work out so you're never going to date and be in a relationship again. I mean, there's a lot of shitty therapists out there because there's a lot of shitty people out there, right? There's shitty people in every industry. If you landed upon a shitty therapist, it doesn't speak to all therapists. It just speaks to that therapist. Keep looking, keep going. Um sometimes it takes a little bit for you to find the right fit, but also also notice if it com- becomes a pattern. Notice if it feels like a way in which you're running from yourself by trying to find just the perfect fit. Okay, so let's move into termination or ending treatment, ending therapy. How do you know when it's time to end therapy? Now, let's say you've only seen your therapist for a short amount of time. By short amount, I mean less than, um, hmm, let's say around three months, okay? So short amount of time, we've seen them for about three months, and it's just not feeling right. It's just not feeling good. Um, You may want to end treatment so that you can find someone that feels better, that feels like the right fit. Now, how you end treatment with your therapist is really up to you. Um, You can email them, you can call them. I always encourage um, people, if you want to end it with your therapist, to go in person and to talk about it and to have a final session together where you can wrap up the the treatment. You can wrap it up and um, maybe the therapist will help you refine referrals for someone else. Maybe you two can get clear on what was working and what isn't. And maybe it's the modality. Maybe it's the approach. Maybe it's the therapist herself, himself. And um, by talking about it with the therapist, you two can decide that. Sometimes the therapist decides it's not the right fit. Sometimes the therapist, you know, after a first session or a few sessions is like, you know what, what you're bringing up isn't something I feel is within my scope. Um, It doesn't all, it doesn't usually happen, but it can, particularly if something's going on for you is very specific and the therapist may give you referrals and it's generally nothing personal. It's They're not saying there's something broken about you that they're not capable of fixing. It's usually more like that the therapist can see something that you can't, that they can see their own limitations and, and what you may need um, and want to give you the best service, the best referral. Now, it's much harder when it's to, to end therapy when it's a longer term treatment. Let's say you've been in treatment for six months, a year, two years, three, you know, and you are feeling like it's time to end it. The ideal termination is, you know, when the the patient and the therapist agrees that the outcome 
has been reasonably successful. That's the ideal termination. And usually it's not the the therapist isn't the one who introduces it. It's usually the patient who introduces it. And then the therapist and patient talks about it over the course of several months and slowly wrap things up. Sometimes therapists will titrate uh, um, the treatment down, like we meet weekly and then we meet every other week and then we meet once a week. Sometimes it's just like a more abrupt kind of, okay, we'll have our, you know, 10 sessions and then that's it. You know, it really depends on your therapist and you and how you two have worked together. Um, But it can be really hard when we're starting to feel like, oh, maybe it's time for us us to move on. And it can be um, difficult to have that conversation with our therapist. But it's also as, uh, you know, how we terminate with someone long term is often an indication, a sign of how we're understanding and relating to ourselves and other people in the world. And, you know, therapists are professional and you're not responsible for taking care of the therapist. But the two of you have a relationship and it may be nice to be able to end the relationship in a way that feels really good for the both of you. And that means like giving it time and talking about it for a little bit. And um, it's not to say that your therapist has to agree with you necessarily. It's just like it's maybe useful for you to have a, a, a completion that feels different than the ways in which we tend to terminate things in our lives where things are abrupt and fast and hard. Maybe we can end treatment in a way that feels softer and more gentle and more corrective. I mean, the therapy relationship is supposed to be somewhat more of the ideal relationship that we can experience and that can help us heal our other relationships. And so ending it is no different. Now, Let's say, you know, you went to a couple therapists, it all sucked, like it's not working. Now what? Well, this is where it gets complicated and it's individualized. I don't know. Maybe it's you really haven't found the right therapist or maybe there's something within yourself that's blocking you from connecting with a therapist. Maybe you're afraid of what will really come up for you if you really let yourself get into therapy Or maybe, yeah, you're kind of having bad luck and and finding things that aren't the right fit. There are so many wonderful clinicians out there. There's so many people who care. Um, My encouragement is to, to keep going as much as you can until you find the right person for you, because that right person makes a difference. Um... The reason why I think that there are so many shitty therapists is, like I said before, because there's shitty people in every industry, but there's an expectation that therapists are above human, that they're beyond being human, when in fact they are human, and it's a human field, and there's going to be human in it, and that means corruption, and that means bad shit, and, and also that means really wonderful healing shit, too. Um, and I also think that accessibility is a part of this conversation too. I mean, you know, where therapy is most accessible at community clinics um, and therapists who are willing to go lower on a sliding scale fee tend to be newer therapists, more established, better therapists tend to have a full private practice. They're not as available. They're not as um, easy to book, you know, really established uh, therapists aren't on psychology today. Not, I'm not saying all, but some. If you have a private practice that's flourishing, they may not even have a website. I mean, this is what's frustrating about the mental health field is that it has been predominantly so word of mouth before that some of the best therapists don't even have a website. Uh, so we have to play like this is a, a really unfortunate and frustrating part of this field. Most therapists that are take insurance um, are getting a pay cut. And um, on the one hand, it makes their work more accessible. And on the other, sometimes they're not as good quality therapists. And they tend to be CBT oriented and they tend to be limited sessions because of insurance. And it's just a whole frustrating thing. And we bring ourselves wherever we go. And that's no exception to therapy. You know, having a bad experience, uh, it's 
that's one thing. But when we're finding ourselves chronically testing therapists, um, unconsciously, we may be putting these huge expectations of what therapy should be. Um, if you, um, you know, are not understanding what you're seeking, you may be playing something out here. And that may be important for you to think about. If you had a bad experience, it may be important for you to think about what happened. Partially, I'm sure, you know, the therapist and what happened, you know, just what part of it was a therapist, what part of it was you, what part of it is in between, like what's going on, you know, how can I uh, deepen my understanding of what happened so that we can do it differently in the future? It's, it's, always of benefit to us to think about a little bit more deeply what's going on instead of just saying, oh, it's a shitty therapist. Oh, shitty therapists are shitty. They just want my money. I'm done with this. I'm not getting help. I'm beyond help. Yes. Now, then the great question is, well, how do I know that therapy is working? You know, how do I know that it's working? And I think we know that it's working through a myriad of ways and it's all very personal. Um, but for me, I know that it's working because one, the, the relationship, the, the, me and my therapist, we, it feels good. I'm, I'm going there. I feel heard. I feel understood. And that's really corrective for me. It's really important for me to have a place in my life where I feel like there's someone who's there for me, listens to me, um, doesn't try to fix me. I really need that. And so the therapy itself tells me that it's working. There's also, of course, the alleviation of symptoms, which may not happen at first or it may happen at first and get worse. And sometimes it oscillates because life changes. Um, so sometimes alleviation of symptom or eradication of symptoms may be a sign that the therapy is working. Though if it comes back, it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the therapy. It may have to do with life. Um, but ultimately, I think we know that it's working because we're starting to see growth in our lives. We're starting to relate to ourselves and people differently. We're not as reactive as we used to react. We're not as closed off as we used to be. We're more flexible, more open, more whatever it is that, that we're seeking and craving. It's usually very, very subtle and very soft. It's Therapy isn't meant to change who you are, right? It's just meant to give you more adaptive ways of thinking of yourself and relating to the world. And um, it's subtle but potent what can happen when we're in the right type of support, where it just feels like we're, we're making sense of things that have felt very stagnant within us. And there's so much more I could say to this, but that's what's coming to mind uh, right now. Um, yes? Uh, okay, so... It's wild. Like I'm on Quora. Is that how you pronounce it? Cura, Cura, Quora. I think it's Quora. Um, and there's so many good questions here that I wish that I could spend time in this series answering. Like, um, here's a question. I don't like therapy because it feels like a fake relationship. My therapist is paid to act like they care. I can't get past this. Is therapy just not for me? Um, that's such a great question. Or, um, my therapist doesn't write anything down during our sessions, uh, but somehow she remembers everything I tell her. How does she do this? Uh, I don't write anything down in my sessions. I, there was a time when I used to, um, but I, I really let my, my brain just soak in what is meant to be remembered will be remembered. Um, Ah, there's just so many good questions. I wish I could answer it. And I'm, I'm definitely going to do another part to this, but, um, I would love to hear from all of you of how this series has been helpful for you. Um, you know, my invitation, of course, for all of, of all of this series is, um, that you can get the help you need. And that if you're open to it, if you're willing to do the work, um, and you find a good match, like, things can really shift and open and change for you. I don't think anyone is beyond help. Um, 
And that's it. This concludes part four of the series. Part five is going to be for potential clinicians, people who are interested in going into the field. It's going to be my experience of going into the field. I'm going to answer questions about um, the difference why I didn't go into social work and uh, or get a, a master's in social work and chose a master's in um, clinical psychology and, and all of that. I got so many questions from all of you who have messaged me, um, and that's going to be part five. And then, yes, in the future, I'll have more of this. I mean, there's so much more to say here. But I'm tired, and it's time for me to go eat. I love all of you. Thank you for being here with me on Reclaim the Podcast. I hope this has been useful for you. I can't wait to hear from you, and I'll see you next week for part five. <laughs>